The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is The Role of the Criminal Justice System in Addressing Elder Abuse Perpetrators, and I'll introduce our speakers shortly. Uh, next slide. A few disclaimers before we get started. Uh, some of the content from Ms. Heisler's presentation is taken from the NAPSICOR competency number 22, working with criminal justice system, and you have a link here. Um, by the way, you can access today's slides in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel, so you can get to that link. Um, from Shelley Jackson, the opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the Department of Justice. And then um, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System and the APS TARC are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WR May Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent those of the federal government. Uh, next slide. Quick note about our APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC as we call it. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Contact info will be displayed at the end of our webinar. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. If you work for an APS program, you may reach out to us for help at any time. That's why we're here. Next slide. Please consider joining one of our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three calls per month. We have one for investigators, one for supervisors, and one for administrators. Uh, the schedules for these for these calls is on your screen, or you can go to our website, um, or just email us if you'd like additional information. But we do have a web page on our site dedicated to our peer calls where you can um, see this same schedule. So do consider joining one of these. They're very beneficial. Next slide. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, the slides today, as I said a bit ago, are available to download in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just click on the icon that looks like a little piece of paper and you can download those to your computer. Um, all participants are muted for the duration of this webinar. You can use your computer or your phone to access audio and please adjust your volume to your desired level. If you have any problems with the audio or viewing the presentation, we suggest either exiting the webinar and re-entering or sending us a message. Let us know what your issues are and we'll try to work those out for you. Next slide. If you have questions of our presenters, you can simply type those questions in the questions chat slash chat box at any time. We'll pause for questions um, at a certain point and we'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can relay those to our speakers. The session is being recorded. Recorded. It will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify everyone who's registered today via email uh, when it's posted online. And also, you'll receive an automatically generated email um, within about an hour of concluding this webinar with a link to a certificate of attendance, if you'd like to keep that um, for your records. Next slide. Now, a quick attendee poll to get a feel for everybody in the audience. I'm going to launch this poll right now, so your screen is going to change a little bit. Um, which of the following categories do you identify the most with? And you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Are you an adult protective services professional, an other social services professional, medical professional, a legal professional, or do you consider yourself other? You don't fit into any of those categories. So I'm going to leave uh, this up for just a little bit to give folks a chance to vote. If you're having trouble voting, it may be because you're in full screen mode. You may have to exit that to vote, um, but you can make your selection by clicking directly on the screen. And in a moment, I'll close out the poll and share the results with everybody. We'll give it just another 10 seconds. All right, and I'm about to close that poll out and share the results. It looks like 53% of you are APS professionals, so that's the lion's share. 23% consider yourself other social services professional. 1% are medical, 11% legal, and then 11% consider themselves other. Don't fit into any of those categories, so thanks so much for that. Next slide. 
Um, so I'd like to introduce today's speakers. We have three speakers today. Candace Heisler is a very knowledgeable speaker and former California prosecutor. She's done more presentations on the prosecution of elder abuse than I could possibly list today. And I'm very glad she's with us. Also, Shelley Jackson is a consultant with the Elder Justice Initiative at the Department of Justice. and She's equally knowledgeable about criminal justice and law enforcement issues in adult maltreatment. And then last but not least, Carl Urban is my coworker here at the APS TARC. He's a former APS administrator from the state of Texas. He's what I would call a fellow APS nerd and an excellent speaker. So I think we are very lucky to have all of these speakers with us today. And I will turn things over to our presenters. So thank you very, very much, uh, Andy, and good afternoon to everyone. Let me begin by just quickly summarizing what we hope to accomplish over the next hour. We want to understand the roles and goals of the criminal justice system uh, in cases involving elder abuse. We're going to talk about the potential of perpetrator and interagency coordination data to guide the justice system in thinking about how to handle cases. We want to talk about the importance and role of community partners in addressing the needs of perpetrators whose cases may find themselves in the criminal justice system. And finally, we're going to identify ways APS programs can both use and improve data collection regarding perpetrators and interagency coordination. As we get started, next slide, please. I'm going to begin, this is Candace, talking about just an overview of the criminal justice system and more specifically the prosecutor function. Shelley Jackson will follow me and is going to talk more broadly about perpetrator knowledge, what we know about perpetrators and how systems think about perpetrators. And then Carl will come and discuss Namer's data that some of you may have participated in gathering regarding perpetrators. And together, we hope this will get you thinking about how you can, how this information can affect your practice and perhaps how we can get better data into the criminal justice system. Um, next slide, and we're going to ask you about this question. And Andy, uh, let me quickly review the poll question and then I'm going to ask you to launch. So we're asking you to describe your experience with sending cases to prosecutors. Have you ever sent one? You've sent some cases that you thought should be prosecuted, but they never were. You've sent, pros, uh, you've sent cases that you thought should be prosecuted, and at least some have gone forward. And uh, you're in a very exclusive club, the final group. Everything you've sent has been filed by a prosecutor. So, Andy, if you'll please launch the poll. I have launched that poll for everybody, and the answers are slightly abbreviated. What has been your experience sending cases to prosecution? You've never sent a case. You have sent cases, but ne they've never been prosecuted. You've sent cases only some, and as Candy said, the last and most rare case, all cases have been prosecuted that you've sent. And we'll leave this open for a few seconds. Again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen and letting us know what you think. If you're in full screen mode, you may have to exit that to respond. Um, and it looks like our votes are rolling in by the vast majority of the audience. I think I'll leave it open for another 10 seconds or so before sharing the results with everybody. All right, I'm going to close that poll out and share the results. Looks like 49% of the folks today have never sent a case to a prosecutor. 19% have sent cases, but they've never been prosecuted. 32% have sent cases, but only some are prosecuted, and 1% have sent cases, and all of them have been prosecuted. So thanks for... I want that person to contact me <laughs> after the webinar, and we will talk. I want to know the secret. So thank you. And um, if you'll please go on to the next slide. I think from the polls, we can see that there's varied experience uh, with working with prosecutors, and some of you may bring a level of frustration. Um, in how you think prosecutors have handled your cases. 
My goal over the next very few minutes in talking about how prosecutors approach cases and giving you a little sense of the both ethical and legal landscape in which prosecutors operate is going to help you better understand uh, how prosecutors think about your cases and perhaps give you insights into what might be different going forward uh, in your practice. I want to start by talking about what is the purpose and function, the role and duty of a prosecutor. Um, these words, this quote is from the American Bar Association, which promulgates model standards for prosecutors, defense attorneys, and lawyers in general. Many states have modeled their own ethical rules on these ABA standards, and this a uh, particular comment mirrors language that has come down in opinions on the purpose and duty of the prosecutor from the United States Supreme Court. So the primary duty of a prosecutor is not merely to convict, but it's to seek justice within the bounds of the law. We serve, prosecutors serve the public interest which requires that prosecutors act with integrity and balanced judgments. Um, and it mandates and guides us to pursue appropriate charges of appropriate severity and on some occasions to exercise discretion to not pursue prosecution at all. So, with that in mind, I think I'd like to talk about what the prosecutor is not, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Thank you. So the prosecutor is not APS's lawyer. The prosecutor is not the police department or sheriff's department lawyer. We don't represent the victim, and we, of course, do not represent the perpetrator. Instead, the prosecutor's duty is to serve the greater community while acknowledging that the victim, the perpetrator, law enforcement, and APS are all part of that community. Next slide, please. In thinking about cases, and here this is sort of a, a shortened view of how APS versus prosecutors approach their work, Take a look at these two categories, and what I'd like you to realize is, while APS conducts investigations around certain issues, prosecutors typically receive cases that have been investigated, so we do not traditionally investigate. While APS typically has to establish uh, that um, an allegation of abuse is more likely than not, that's preponderance of the evidence. Prosecutors work at the highest burden of proof in law, which is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that applies to every element of every crime that is charged. And while APS uh, is able to obtain all kinds of evidence uh, to use in arriving at its conclusion, a prosecutor is highly limited in what evidence it's, uh, it can use in a case. It has to be legally admissible, it has to be relevant, and it has to meet standards of evidence established by state and federal constitutions or tribal codes. Uh, why that's important is APS may feel that it has done a really excellent job in developing a case, and then feel very frustrated when the prosecutor looks at it and says, you did a really nice investigation, but there's nothing we can do with it. The reason for that is our differing burdens of proof or standards of proof and the limitations on what is admissible in a trial in which someone stands to lose their life, their liberty, and their civil rights. It's also a reminder that our systems need to work closely together in order to better understand one another and to create realistic expectations of what we can expect from one another. Next slide, please. So I want to talk now about how prosecutors decide who and what 
to be uh, would be charged. And I really think of it as two questions. The first is, could I charge this case? The second is, if I could, should I charge this case? And I will tell you, oftentimes, the second question is much harder than the first. So let's turn right now to the question of, could I charge? This is a legal and objective factual analysis. We are looking at every piece of admissible evidence and say, asking ourselves, does it meet the legal standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? We are asking ourselves, is there sufficient admissible and credible evidence and witnesses who will say what has to be said that prove those elements? And it's thinking about the likely defenses and whether the available evidence refutes those uh, potential defenses. If we can't meet those standards and refute those likely defenses, we're in a situation where the answer is could I is no. And absent someone getting us more evidence or information, this case will not be able to be prosecuted. If the answer is yes, we can prove uh, that this particular person committed a crime beyond a reasonable doubt, then we will turn to the second question, which is, should I? And we're really asking ourselves, should we exercise our discretion, our considerable discretion, in um, making a decision whether and what to charge? And that's really asking ourselves the question, what best meets this notion of interests of justice? Please, uh, next slide, please. I want to now really uh, drill down a little bit on the should I question. And it, too, um, is really two questions rolled into one. The first is, should the case be charged? And if so, uh, what charge can be proven? Then the question is, having decided that I should prosecute how should I think about a just resolution of the case in the interests of justice? And that's a weighing process that incorporates the victim's voice, wishes, and preferences. Um, whatever information we may have that reflects on the perpetrator's overall life situation, relationship with the victim, the nature of the offense, does this abuser pose a danger to the community at large? And what will be accomplished by prosecution? Will it communicate a message of offender accountability uh, both to the community and to potential other abusers that will be discouraging to them? I think it might be um, useful to give you a very short example. So I want to describe a neglect case. Uh, the hospital is contacted about the neglect of an elderly man who lives in his home with his adult children, his sons. Shortly after being admitted to the hospital, um, he dies. He is covered in pressure ulcers. He's dehydrated. He is malnourished. And there had been a prior hospitalization when his condition was much less dire and the hospital gave very exacting care instructions that were not followed. At first blush, this looks like a thoroughly prosecutable case. But a lot more investigation was done revealing a lot of new information, including that the house in which everyone was living was in disrepair. The roof had caved in after a serious uh, winter storm. No one in the home had funds to conduct repairs. The sons were living in the same manner and conditions as the father. They did not use their dad's income for themselves, but rather were saving it because they knew uh, his uh, end was coming and were going to use the money for his funeral expenses. Uh, the sons had never known about community services, had never been offered services, there had never been a referral to any agency, and they were not functioning well themselves. 
it was the consensus of the community agencies, the law enforcement agency, and the prosecutor that this case did not merit prosecution. But the interests of justice were served by assisting the sons to reach habitable uh, living, to have services, and to have their own needs addressed. And so the decision was made accordingly. Next slide, please. So I told you the next question is, once I've decided I should prosecute, it's thinking ahead to what is in the interest of justice to resolve the case. And it's a balancing of those entities of offender needs, community needs, and victim desires and needs. Um, as we balance, we must think about what are the options that may be available. And if you look to the right side of the screen, you'll see a variety of potential options in some communities, recognizing not all of this is available in every community. We can do traditional incarceration uh, with a conviction. We can think about probation or diversion. We can provide, we can think about community rehabilitation. Um, it may be appropriate to think about a mental health commitment in lieu of prosecution. Some communities have restorative justice programs. Restraining orders may be helpful. Diversion may make sense. And finally, specialized courts may, make, uh, may provide specialties not available elsewhere. And so we need to combine these needs with what's available. Next slide, please. Uh, there is no single answer that's going to work in every case, but I do want to leave some parting thoughts for APS with this really quick flyby of the prosecutor and how we think about cases. You may well be in a jurisdiction where your laws and policy mandate referring cases to uh, the criminal justice uh, system. Please be realistic about your goals and expectations, um, realizing that you bring different standards of proof, goals, and uh, tools that may apply or be available. If it's a really serious case, please think about meeting in advance with the prosecutor to discuss it and talk about how it can and should be filed. If you are lucky enough to have a case review team or an MDT, uh, you're halfway home. If you don't already have relationships and communication with your partners in the criminal justice system, you will benefit by developing them. And then finally, always be aware of what both your agency and the prosecution agency's priorities and resources are as you think about expectations. Um, Save your questions, please enter them, and we'll try to get to them towards the end. But at this point, I want to turn this over to Shelly Jackson to talk more about what options and what are some of the trends regarding perpetrators. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Candy. And thank you for that wonderful explanation of what prosecutors have to think about in these cases. I think it provides a really nice backdrop for now transitioning to perpetrators. So what I'm going to be talking about is what some of the research tells us about elder abuse perpetrators and what that might mean for the criminal justice system. Next. Okay, so I think we can all agree that we've seen the criminalization of elder abuse. Back in the 70s and 80s, there was a focus on caregiver stress. Of course, if you believe that caregiver stress is the cause of a problem, a reasonable response would be respite care for the stressed caretaker. And that's what we saw at that time. So caregivers weren't really characterized as perpetrators, um, but people uh, in need of help. So Carl Pilmer's early work upset this theory by proposing and finding um, that abuser, uh, abuser characteristics, psychopathology, was underlying much of elder abuse. So again, if you believe that the cause of the problem is psychopathology, substance abuse, criminal history, and the like, then a reasonable response would be incarceration, at least in the 90s. Um, and that's what we began to see. 
So what you believe is driving behavior has implications for what you do about it. And this new psychopathology theory, new at the time, uh, contributed to the criminalization of elder abuse. And of course, we know that there were many other factors at play in the 90s, but framing this issue as abuser psychopathology really changed the way we thought about elder abuse, and we began to characterize these individuals as criminal offenders. Of course, we're now learning um, that there is no one theory that explains all offenders, and that is really the purpose of my talk, and so kind of hold that thought as we go through the, the presentation. So next slide. So in terms of elder abuse offender research, our knowledge is really quite limited. The field of elder abuse is typically studied in geriatrics, gerontology, and social work, has focused on victims to the exclusion of offenders. And then in contrast, on the right-hand side, the discipline of criminology is all about offenders, only recently paying any attention to victims. But that discipline likewise has excluded elder abuse offenders, and I would say Brian Payne is probably an exception to this rule, but um, generally. We are left with very little research on elder abuse offenders. Next slide. As further evidence of this, David Burns and his colleagues recently published a scoping review of 52 studies with an elder abuse intervention outcome. And of those 183 outcomes identified, 10% concerned the perpetrator. And you can see that by the middle bar on the graph. Um, and 63% of those outcomes concerned criminal justice outcomes. You know, was the case referred to law enforcement? Was the perpetrator arrested, prosecuted, and things like that? Much less frequently, studies looked at mental health or caregiver stress. So for me, this study confirmed two things. One is we have very little research on perpetrators. And the second is that when we do look at perpetrators, we, we tend to focus on criminal justice um, outcomes. And I think that's in part because that has been our go-to response. Okay, next slide. So I'm sure you're all sitting at your desk asking yourselves, why are we interested in offenders? Next slide. Because with few exceptions, we're generally talking about ongoing and long-term relationships when we're talking about elder abuse. And what the offender does, what happens to the offender, impacts your APS client. Laura Mosqueda and her colleagues have developed the abuse intervention model to depict the importance of the victim, of course, but also the offender and the context. Next slide. Okay. So now, I just said that we have very little research on elder abuse offenders, and that's still true, but I've chosen to discuss some typology research, and I'm gonna explain why in a minute. But for now, this slide shows a number of typology papers, well, four of them, um, but typologies are just categories. And so here we're talking about elder abuse offender perpetrator categories. You can see on the left-hand side that Georgia Ennsberger identified three types of physical abuse offenders, the hostiles, the authoritarians, and the dependents, right? So observing differences even within the same abuse category. And then a decade later, Holly Ramsey Klosnick published a typology based on her clinical experience with elder abuse offenders, right? And so she labeled them overwhelmed, impaired, narcissistic, domineering, and sadistic. So both of these papers are really important for getting us to think about the fact that there are important differences among offenders. But 20 years later, later Marty DeLima and her colleagues used APS data from Illinois to empirically derive elder abuse typologies they used a statistic called latent class analysis, which is just a fancy term that means we put a lot of data into a program, and the statistical program makes meaningful groupings based on the data. Now, Marty labeled her categories as caregivers, temperamental, dependent caregivers, and dangerous. So this was an important advancement in that we now have empirical confirmation that there are differences among offenders. I have one more typology here, and this is from Brazil. Um, I'm showing you just one part of their analyses, but they included 
both the types of abuse and the offender status, and that's why their categories look their labels uh, look a little different. But here you can see that physical abuse by children, for example, is significantly and meaningful different, meaningfully different from physical abuse by an intimate partner. Okay? Now, here's my caution to you. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying as there being an ascending order of danger. That is not the point here. Your clients are at risk from an overwhelmed offender as well as from a domineering offender. Why this distinction is important is because it has implications for how we effectively respond. We wouldn't use the same intervention for an overwhelmed perpetrator as we would for a domineering perpetrator. Now, I have a couple other cautions for you. We certainly know that perpetrators can be manipulative and represent as upstanding and caring individuals. And while one label may look fitting at one point in time, that, may be, that label may change as circumstances are revealed or they change over time. But even with these caveats, this research shows that there are important and meaningful and significantly uh, significant differences among offenders that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about criminal justice interventions. Next. So I went through the elder abuse offender typology research because if you believe, as I do, that there are these important and meaningful differences among offenders, then it seems our interventions likewise need to differ or match up in some way to provide the right balance. And that's why I have this little teeter-totter here. So the example I used in the last slide, the overwhelmed versus the domineering perpetrator, for example, those would be on the left-hand side under the typology. If we wanted this to work out well and balance in some way, the intervention on the right-hand side would need to differ. Now, I've inserted a few of Santos's typology categories here. So again, how we would intervene for physical and psychological abuse by an intimate partner, for example, the blue box, might be very different than what we would do in terms of intervening for a non-family member who's committed a financial crime such as stealing, which is like the orange box. Um, on the left-hand side. So we need to balance this um, teeter-totter out by matching up the typology and the intervention. Next slide. Okay, so earlier, Candy reviewed some of the criminal justice interventions that are available to prosecutors, um, either before they make the decision to prosecute or uh, in making recommendations for sentencing. Um, and I've listed them here again, take a look at them. And there are a number of options. And, um, and I do believe prosecutors think carefully about the decision to prosecute. And if they do decide to pursue prosecution, sentencing recommendations. But the typology research suggests to me that there remains a need to develop new, innovative, maybe more nuanced interventions that address the underlying causal factors that resulted in the harmful behavior in the first place. I wanted to mention here that Mark Lax and his colleagues had just published a paper calling into question the wisdom of prosecution, at least in some cases. And so the pendulum swings. I think there's a growing recognition that prosecution is appropriate in some cases, maybe many cases, maybe most, but certainly not all. And so we're thinking hard about which cases those might be and whether there are alternatives to our current interventions that would be uh, more effective. Next slide. Okay, so I mentioned that prosecutors think carefully about their decision to prosecute and sentencing recommendations they make. Prosecutors are engaged in a struggle of balancing offender accountability on the one hand and community safety, victim safety, victim choice, and many other factors on the other side. Um, and you, Candy mentioned this as well, you're sometimes understandably frustrated that prosecutors don't pursue cases that you bring to them right, when you think that they should prosecute the case. I will say in my talking with APS in Virginia and uh, over the last 10 years across the country, there's tremendous variability among APS on whether they think pros uh, perpetrators should be prosecuted, and, um, but we're gonna have to save that conversation for another day. But I wanted to remind you of the balancing act that you do every day in the work 
that you do. You're balancing victim safety and victim choice. And these are weighty decisions that you are making about clients' lives. And at times, family members and others are irritated or frustrated with you for not doing what they think you should do. So prosecutors are making very tough decisions. And these will always be tough decisions. But if the criminal justice system had more options for responding to the specific needs of elder abuse offenders, and I'll just throw in here that if we had some perpetrator interventions prior to the case even reaching the criminal justice system, that would be even better. Um, but it might ease the burden a little bit. Okay, next slide. So we would likely all agree, I think, that wrapping victims in appropriate services, particularly in a coordinated manner through a multidisciplinary team, is most beneficial for older victim safety, autonomy, and recovery. And there are typically many services that you offer or arrange for older APS clients. Could be civil legal, social support, pet foster care. And I actually think that's a really important one. Um, but I'd also like to propose to you that perpetrators, even those incarcerated, likewise need to be wrapped in appropriate services and it could be job training, substance abuse, housing, respite care, depending on the situation. Now, please, I am in no way suggesting that you are responsible for that wrapping, but I would suggest that you take an interest in it. So leaving perpetrators out of our response to elder abuse is short-sighted at best and dangerous at worst. Just as we shore up the safety for older adults through various services, we need to shore up the needs of perpetrators to enable them to lead productive, crime-free lives for their own benefit, as well as the benefit of your clients. So next slide. And that gets us back to the abuse intervention model, where in many, if not most cases, your clients and their abusers have a relationship that's likely to continue. So even if the perpetrator is incarcerated and your client is safe for a while, where do perpetrators go upon release? They often go back to the home of a loved one. So what the abuse intervention model shows is that what happens to the perpetrator, how we intervene, impacts your client directly as all three, offender, victim, and context, are interconnected. Now, we may not be able to eliminate harm completely, but we should be thinking about how we can do, reduce the risk of harm for those choosing to remain in relationships with their abusers. Okay, next slide. Now, another way to increase victim safety, I think is a universal goal we all have, is working with a multidisciplinary team where there are multiple checks on your client. So clients are receiving services that they need, but also there are multiple eyes on your client. So next slide. Now we have a poll question. Andy, if you want to set that up. Certainly, I will launch that poll for us right now. It's a very simple question. Okay. Are you a member of or participate on a multidisciplinary team or MDT? Yes, no, or not sure. So that's up on the screen now, Shelly, and people can vote by uh, clicking directly on their screen to let us know what their answer is to this. We'll leave this up for a few more okay. seconds. Okay, thank you. We'll leave it up for about 10 more seconds to give folks a chance to vote. All right, I think I'm going to close that poll out now that most people have voted and share the results with everyone. It looks like 57% yeah, say yes, 39% say no, and 4% aren't quite sure whether it meets that. Okay, so that's good. We're over 50%. Um, I will say that we are actively promoting the use of multidisciplinary teams. And um, next slide. So I'm pleased to see so many of you are involved in MDTs. Um, now, I, this is my last slide. I'd like to make a shameless plug for our Elder Abuse Multidisciplinary Team Technical Assistance Center. And uh, Talitha Gwynne Shaver is our MDT Technical Advisor and her contact information is here. We invite you to reach out to her for any uh, consultations you might have. She can help with starting an MDT or maintaining an MDT. But also on the left-hand side are resources on the website that uh, you can just access yourself at elderjustice.gov forward slash MDT. 
And now I will turn it over to Carl to talk about something he's quite familiar with, <laughs> namers. And I remember to unmute myself, which is always helpful in this kind of webinar type thing. So I'm going to talk about the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System uh, and the data that we collect on perpetrators and law enforcement referrals. Next slide, Carl. Uh, which means I got to click on that. So uh, the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is some of the limitations in the data. Uh, First, NAMERS, as it's affectionately known as, is, is a system for collecting data from adult mal, from adult protective service programs on adult maltreatment. Uh, collects data across a number of attributes, uh, one of which is data on perpetrators and another one of which is investigations. And within the investigations attribute, uh, it does collect information on referrals to law enforcement and prosecutors. Um, it's really important to understand that this is about the adult maltreatment perspective on perpetrators uh, and law enforcement referrals. It's not a criminal justice lens to look at it. Um, there's also data completeness issues uh, within NAMERS. So there are pretty substantial gaps uh, between the aspirational aspects of what NAMERS would like to ideally collect and what it actually does collect. Um, and so in the data that I'm about to show you, we're going to show you only the data, uh, not all the data that's collected by namers, but only the data that we thought was reasonably enough complete um, to not be misleading in any way. Uh, a lot of the data for law enforcement referrals was a really small sample. So even for the data that we are showing you, uh, please take into consideration that it should not be considered representative for all APS programs. Um, so here's what I'm talking about specifically for uh, perpetrator data. Uh, so what you see here is a list of data elements that we collect information on perpetrator data. Um, from the basic demographic information at the top to the legal remedies sought at the bottom. And in the next column, you can see uh, what we consider to be the completeness of the data. And really, the only two data elements that we consider that the, the, the information is reasonably complete is for the two demographic data elements. And if you work in an APS program or around an APS program, that's probably um, not surprising to you. Uh, we could have a much longer conversation about completeness of data, probably. But just know and remember that NAMERS was built with those aspirational data elements in mind what would we really like to know? And over time, hopefully, we will get to a place where um, APS programs, as they try to align themselves with NAMERS, are able to collect more and more of this data. So what do we know about um, perpetrators? Uh, the two things that we do know pretty good about, as I said, is age is the first one. Uh, and so this is a graph that shows percent of perpetrators by age group. I'm um, not going to spend a long time on this, but, but basically what you see is that uh, perpetrators tend to be younger than older. Uh, the highest percentage is in middle age, and I'll ask you to stop and think about why that may be, and we'll look at some more data in a minute that maybe answers the question. Um, second thing uh, to think about in terms of the good data is perpetrator demographic information by gender. And you can see that there are more males than females, but not by much. Um, we also looked at the relationship between the kinship of the perpetrator and the maltreatment type. And so that's what you see in this particular chart. In the rows, you've got the maltreatment types. In the columns, you've got um, the type of kinship um, between the perpetrator and, and the victim. Um, and so I think that the best way to look at this graph is to start on the far right. And so what you can see in the far right column on no kinship is that it is by far the biggest category for all of the maltreatment types. Um, and so then when you start thinking about when there is a kinship relationship, 
probably the best place to look is at the far left, and you'll see that children are the most frequent perpetrators among relatives. Uh, it's not even close compared to the other categories. And so when you go back to thinking about age a second ago, if adult children are the most frequent um, kinship perpetrators, then this is, that explains kind of the age consideration. Um, and so here is our next poll question as we, as we switch over to thinking about the, the referrals to law enforcement. So the poll question is, what percent of APS cases nationally do you think are referred to law enforcement? And Andy, if you would launch that poll, I would appreciate it. Certainly, I've done that now. Um, so just vote again, like with the other polls, by clicking directly on your screen. Again, what percent of APS cases nationally do you think are referred to law enforcement? Zero to 10%, 10% to 50, 50% to 75, or 75% to 100%. Leave that open for a few more seconds. Actually, the majority of people have already voted. <clears throat> we still have a few folks yet to vote. Thumbs it up for just a little bit longer. So about 10 more seconds and then we'll close it out. All right, so I'm gonna close this poll out and then share the results with everybody. And it looks like 40% think zero to 10, 51% 10 to 50%, and then 8% think 50 to 75%, 1% at the very last from 75% to 100. So the largest one is 10% to 50%, 51 folks, 51 percent folks. And so um, just uh, the answer is in the bottom bullet there. Overall, the percentage of clients referred to law enforcement was 7.5% nationally, and the highest state was 55%. Uh, so as we're thinking about referral data to law enforcement, um, just know that what we're talking about is, is a category that we call interagency coordination. It includes referrals to law enforcement or prosecutorial offices. Uh, protection and advocacy programs, long-term care ombudsman, among others. Uh, overall, interagency coordination was provided to 50% of APS clients, uh, although often the exact agency that the, that the uh, referral is made to is not identified. Uh, some, some of the information on law enforcement referrals, this chart shows a comparison for gender of all APS clients compared to the clients that are referred to law enforcement. So all APS clients is the orange bar, uh, the referred clients is the, is the blue bar, and you can see that there's really not much significant difference. Um, uh, females tend to be referred a little bit more often than males. So we have a similar sort of referral here for age, and, and the conclusion from this chart is that the very old and the very young among APS clients are most often referred to uh, law enforcement and prosecutorial. Uh, the last comparison here is by maltreatment type. So it's the same comparison, and here uh, you see a very significant difference between clients and client, all clients and clients referred. Uh, this is really not that surprising when you think about it. Uh, when you look at the abuse types of maltreatment, financial exploitation, uh, physical abuse, you see that clients referred are more much higher than, for example, self-neglect. Again, that's probably not very surprising. Um, so what does all of this uh, mean? Um, you know, we, we, back in that earlier chart, identified some fields and namers that we would like to see improved with better data collection. Um, that's one of our, our things that we're, we work with our states to try to do is to help fulfill, fill in some of those aspirational elements of, of namers, data elements, and clearly better information on perpetrators and law enforcement referrals 
um, is an area for us to focus on. Uh, our current understanding of how elder abuse is referred to the criminal justice system is relatively weak. Uh, that's been identified in several recent papers identifying data needs. Um, we believe that these other sources of data, such as prosecutor data and multidisciplinary team data, could complement namers. Um, and so the, the totality, all of this data, if we can figure out ways to, to have it work together complementary, uh, can help us uh, simply describe data, describe cases. It's going to provide a better analysis of prosecution over time, uh, as a couple of the papers that Shelley referred to. It's going to give us comprehensive comparisons across jurisdictions. Um, uh, once and we, and we could also learn about the impact of the criminal justice system on offenders and victims. There is just much right opportunity for us to figure out how to make our, our data systems work together, talk together across all of these areas that you see listed on the screen here. So we get a better understanding of this dynamic uh, relationship between the criminal justice system and the APS system. So what? So what are the key takeaways um, from all of the stuff that we have been discussing today? Um, and, and we are, and, and Candace and Shelley are, and I are curious of what do you think are the key takeaways from all of this today? So please feel free to use the question box to either ask us questions about it um, or to tell us what you think. And so we've identified here uh, some of the things that we think are important. Um, it's important for APS to understand how prosecutors analyze cases for charging and, and resolution. Um, it's important to understand what are the things that guide the prosecutors in making their decisions uh, that Candace talked about. Um, you know, APS and criminal justice are natural allies. They have very complementary roles, and those roles need to work together through communication, coordination, through multidisciplinary teams, all geared toward the well being of APS clients. Uh, one of the things that has become clearer and clearer over time is that both systems have an interest in addressing offender needs. Some APS programs very proactively provide services to perpetrators, but a lot do not. Um, I think another thing that we're learning, and this was reflected in the poll earlier, is that NDTs are a valuable and powerful resource for us as we are trying to do this. It's to get those systems coordinated and communicated and working together, focused on ensuring the best possible outcomes for our victims by addressing what are the offenders' needs. We still have a long ways to go, though, in understanding all of this. We have got to figure out how to collect better information from the adult protective services systems, from the criminal justice systems, and then get creative in making those data sets complementary so we understand better how to improve those systems. Uh, so as we have got a few minutes left, here is our question for you. Uh, what are the implications of what we have discussed for your work? Uh, we'd love to hear an answer to that in the question box. Or if you have any questions for us, please put that in the question box and Andy is going to facilitate our discussion from here on in. Thank you, Carl. Um, we do have quite a few comments and questions, and we've got about six minutes left, so we're not going to be able to get to all of them, unfortunately. But let me get to some of the key ones that I can ask. Um, so question number one, how can a prosecutor determine the interests of justice if, if the prosecutor does not, does not have knowledge or understanding of elder abuse? Again, how can a prosecutor determine the interests of justice if the prosecutor does not have knowledge or understanding of elder abuse? Um, this is Candace. I think that's probably a question I should try to answer. And I think the question almost answers itself. Uh, one of the reasons that there's been so much energy put into training prosecutors is because, as the question suggests, elder abuse is different. And prosecutors who handle these cases need to be trained in its unique qualities. Um, 
So the question becomes, how do we get that education to prosecutors? Um, I see a related question about the National Institute on Prosecution of Elder Abuse. Um, the National Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life is currently scheduling a series of prosecutor webinars. If you'll contact NCAL or me, uh, we can give you more information. Um, these are going to be a substitute this year for the NIPEA course. We hope as soon as COVID uh, is under greater control, we can resume actually offering the in-person. But I would also say getting prosecutors handling these cases to MDTs, um, thinking about existing elder abuse serving organizations and having them help reach out to the prosecutor, and I would also add in law enforcement uh, are some small steps, but important ones that communities can take to enhance the knowledge of prosecutors. Excellent, thank you, Candy. Um, another question, I love the idea of wraparound services for offenders, and I think it's absolutely necessary. Who do you see being responsible for that? Again, I love the idea of wraparound services for offenders. Who do you see being responsible for that? So that might be for me. Um, I so we could do a we could do it a couple ways. Um, as I mentioned, I, I would be really interested in seeing these services for um, potential perpetrators even before they reach the criminal justice system, so that we can intervene before it gets that far. Um, but once it gets that far, I, I do think it's part of the, uh, it can be part of the sentencing, part of, um, you know, the, the negotiation that the prosecutor kind of thinks about um, in what kind of sentencing it recommends for, uh, to the courts. So um, I guess depending on where we are in a case, uh, different people would have responsibility, but ultimately the criminal justice system. I, I think, I, I don't know this for sure, and I probably shouldn't say it out loud, but it may be cheaper for us to kind of think about what uh, alternative interventions and services as opposed to incarceration. Um, so that, that it depends is my answer. But Candy, do you have any thoughts? I, I'm thinking of a couple of additional things. I, I don't disagree with anything you've pointed out. But I think it uh, can start with a groundswell from the community and using uh, elder abuse coordinated community responses or task forces um, or multidisciplinary teams, whether they're case review or uh, looking at specific sorts of cases. That is a place where cases can be analyzed and needs identified um, because Criminal justice professionals and community professionals are parts of those entities. They become the natural allies for seeking agency support. A key group that needs to be included would be pretrial services, probation, and parole, uh, because they are dealing most directly with offenders and frequently are unaware of such community services. And of course, educating the court and using existing diversion programs and staff for diversion or specialty courts can also be advocates for creating needed uh, community services if it gets as far as the criminal justice system. Thank you, Candy. And I think we'll have time for one last question here as we reach the top of the hour. Can you give a hypothetical example of why a report of self-neglect would be referred to a prosecutor? And I've, this is Candace again, I can think of one example uh, that it may not, and we're going to just start with self-neglect is rarely a criminal matter. It could be, actually, I'm sick of two examples. One is it comes up in the guise of a code enforcement action because the self-neglect is extending to creating a, a community hazard uh, to health and safety of people living in the area or other apartment dwellers. That would be one way. The other way is sometimes we realize that self-neglect is an outcome of a criminal victimization. And so you could start with what has happened 
and by investigating what has led up to it, and that might be by APS, it's unlikely to be by criminal justice, it could also be by a mental health entity or uh, other kinds of health organizations. Um, it reveals the prior victimization, and that can be uh, the way the criminal justice system gets involved. So those would be two examples that I can offer. Thank you so much, Candy. And Carl, if you could go to our last slide real quick. Um, I think we have some contact information for everybody. And again, you can download these slides um, in the handout section. We will be posting the recording of this webinar and the slides today on the web, and we'll notify you when those are up online. I just wanted to thank all of our attendees for joining us today. We had a pretty good crowd. Um, and thanks so much to our speakers, Candy, Carl, and Shelley, for giving us all of this information. Um, Please stay tuned for more webinars from the APS TARC. We would love to have you join us for each and every one of them. Again, thanks so much to our speakers um, and have a great afternoon, everyone.